name is Olivia Haynes, and I'm the co-director of the Ruben Mark Initiative for Educational Management and Leadership here at Columbia Business School. And I am so excited, a little bit fangirling over these two, for this amazing special session of our organizational leadership series, featuring a sweet time conversation with Cindy Bigelow, president and CEO of a local family business, Bigelow Tea, as well as our amazing first year student, Wangene Hall. So before I hand it over today, I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank our sponsors. First, the Global Family Enterprise Program, which is an educational hub here at CBS with courses, dedicated research, and extracurricular offerings covering all aspects of owning, managing, and working within family enterprises. Second, Bigelow Tea, uh, who graciously supplied, supplied us with all the delicious food today. And then finally, the Ruben Mark Initiative for Organizational Character and Leadership, which leverages the intellectual capital of both Columbia Business and Law Schools to teach the leadership skills necessary to create optimal organizational culture. Mr. Ruben Mark, who is a longtime former CEO of Colgate Palmolive, was an innovator in this field of org culture and leadership, and we are so thankful for his support. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator to get us started. Uh, Wangane Hall is a first year student in ABC alumni mentorship for the Family Business Club here at CBS. She currently serves as a board member for her family's enterprise, Global Village Foods, which manufactures allergy, allergy friendly food with bold African flavors sold online and in Whole Foods co ops and more. Wangane knows firsthand what it's like to grow up supporting and being involved in a family business that is innovation, ethics, and values-based leadership at the center of its culture, which makes her a perfect facilitator for today's conversation. With that, I'll pass it over, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it is my great honor and great pleasure to introduce Cindy Bigelow. Uh, Cindy Bigelow is the third generation CEO of her family business, Bigelow T. She joined the company in 1986 and spent time in various roles before becoming CEO in 2005. She's been instrumental in growing the company from introducing holiday and seasonal teas to a focus on sustainability to even certifying the company as a B corporation. In addition to that, she's been a great steward of the organization, <laughs> making sure that employees are key stakeholders in the firm's growth. She has her MBA from the Kellogg School of Management. We'll forgive her for my <laughs> And she's also a mother, a skier, a tennis player, and an avid tea drinker. Please welcome Cindy Bigelow. I see lots of cups of tea here, so I already feel pretty welcome. <laughs> So, Cindy, your grandmother, Ruth Bigelow, started Bigelow Tea. Mm -hmm. Why tea? And is her blend of constant comment the original recipe? Uh, that's a great question. Why tea? Um, she actually was an interior designer, um, and she lost everything during the Depression. And so she wrote these copious notes, which I had an opportunity to read. She was a beautiful writer, and she loved to write. And she just said that I want to be, it's really quite fascinating to me, I want to be in a consumable, but not a perishable. So I want more clients. As an interior designer, she had X amount of clients. Right? In this particular case, she wanted a much larger pool of potential individuals to enjoy. And again, she didn't want the issues that were associated with perishability, which I just love that whole thought process, um, that she was thinking like that. And she found an old recipe that she actually never found the recipe she'd heard about this old colonial recipe where over the holidays in these crocks they would take tea and spices and orange and they would let it sort of sit for X amount of time. So she went into the, her kitchen and just kept working and working it and that's how she came up with constant comment. And uh, today, which is really kind of fun for me 80 years later, is that it's still one of the top 10 teas sold in the United States of America. And that's pretty amazing, because I get sad when I see about businesses that go under. It's never fun for me to see the fact that her tea is still number, you know, in the top 10. Now, in terms of the recipe, um, 
That is something that we hold near and dear. It is a secret recipe, so I can tell you no details. <laughs> so don't open up a tea bag and figure it out. You might be able to. Uh, and what's sweet is um, that my parents, who are 96 and 94, up to last year, when my dad is uh, now unfortunately dealing with cancer, um, they were the only ones that made constant comment. The mix is what we call, and that is blended with the different uh, teas that we use. And so it's definitely the same recipe made by the same loving family hands. It's now made by one particular individual that we consider like family. But yeah, the ingredients, the size of the ingredients, because a lot of it, when she started it, it was a loose tea, and it was actually very hard to get into a tea bag. And we sometimes have that problem when we're producing it on the machines. It can sometimes pierce the, the paper because of the size of the cut of these things. But we will not change that. So yes, a long-winded answer. It's the same recipe. <laughs> yeah, just saying. <laughs> Fantastic. And for anyone who doesn't know, constant comment is the best you'll ever taste. Um, it's my favorite, personally. My family is a big tea family. My mom is from Kenya. They do tea very well over there. Um, and it is orange spice, uh, a black tea. Really, really, really good. It is good. Try it. I, I hope we, we I, I thought we have some tea up here, so um, I don't know if we have enough constant comment, but if you want, I can send you extra, somehow get out to everybody. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about leadership. The Ruben Mark Initiative teaches leaders the skills and the strategies to create an optimal organizational culture. What key experiences have really informed your view on leadership and creating organizational best practices since you joined the company in 1986? Well, I think your, your leadership style grows, um, as that would only make sense to everybody in this room over time. And it grows by watching what you like. And it grows by making mistakes. So for everyone in this room, I guess you're going to maybe make one or two. I know I have to help really develop who you want to be. I think the question is to always challenge yourself on what does that look like. So, you know, for me, my foundation of uh, what I would say my earlier leadership style was based on what I saw from my father, which was <coughs> fairness. He was really into fairness. What was a big thing for him was fairness. Uh, if you wanted to see him get upset, something wasn't going to be fair for somebody in the organization. So fairness. And another strange uh, quality that I learned as, as I got older that I didn't realize I was learning as I was younger, uh, it's a funny terminology, but my father is not a greedy person. Uh, it's not an individual or money is a conversation, money is a focus. And I know you might say, well, I don't know what you might say on that. You can ask me later. But, um, and so I grew up not thinking about money first. Uh, and I, I do think that that's an interesting and possibly unique or more rare quality for someone in my seat. But that's, I, always were, I was always doing things for the right reason. Uh, profit was not driving that. Money was not driving that. And I was always trying to make sure I was creating a fair environment. So for me, those basic leadership skills really started from what I, I got from my father. And then as time grew, I, I developed hopefully a few more skill sets. Fantastic. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about being in a family business. You kind of already touched on this. Um, would love to hear what traits, leadership, skills did you get from those in your family? And what do you feel like are like more unique to you? And also talk to me a little bit about the Bigelow house. Oh, the Bigelow home. I have my Bigelow home. It's in my briefcase. Yeah, it's so I love that. Well, first of all, how many of you individuals in this room here um, either have a family business or exposed to family business or interested in family business? Okay. Um, there, there are, they're different. <laughs> they're awesome. They're, they're, they're very different, though. But um, you... You know, they definitely have an influence of of who you are in the family business because you are in a business with your other family members. So in terms of uh, that influence from them, it was obviously very significant. Uh, you know, I created something here that you, thank you for bringing attention, called the Bigelow Home. And for me, when you talk about how you want to lead an organization, I think about the fact that it's a small business compared to a lot of businesses you guys are going to have exposure to and maybe be involved in. We have 450 what I call family members that um, work for Bigelow, are part of Bigelow. 
350 are in the manufacturing arena and about 100, 120 are uh, sort of in the corporate side of the business. So everybody has different roles. They're all doing different things. And I really challenged myself a few years back to say, how do I align everyone to sort of have that same uh, purpose or feeling good about what they're doing or you know, being part of something? So I created what I call the Bigelow Home. Uh, it looks kind of cute, I have to say. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> you got to just humor me for a minute on that. Uh, and it took me about two years to design it. And uh, it basically was just to create an environment of pride that brings out everyone's desire and ability to make a difference every day. And that's really what I look at. And from that you comes your vision of making that uncompromising quality tea bag. But I think for any of you and all of you in the room that are looking to be future leaders, you probably already are leaders, you know, you need to make sure that how do you get everybody on the same page? And so for me, establishing a purpose like that and really trying to live it every day, I think really helped establish my leadership today, my skill sets today, and how people look at me is that as I, I create a purpose and I try to live it and I try to make people really feel part of that. Fantastic. Um, so you talked about purpose. You talked about creating an uncompromising quality tea bag. I would love to hear, as you think about the next generation and where Bigelow's tea is going to go, um, and you think about staying competitive, what are some of the top priorities you see for growth in the next generation? Well, first of all, I, yeah, I feel very, very fortunate because um, we do confuse the competition because we're this little family company in Connecticut run by a, a woman who doesn't do anything else but make tea. And <laughs> they just don't understand how we keep doing well year after year. And, uh, and uh, about two years ago, we achieved not just, and this is something I'm very proud of, and I, I believe me, I take great, great uh, joy in sharing, is that we not, not only were the number one specialty tea, but we actually became the number one tea company in the United States of America, which was a really big deal. So that formula, everybody always wants to ask, you know, what is that formula? And I say, it's just, it's just not a magic bullet. It's just not a magic bullet. It's never compromising on anything for a moment. And everything matters. So it's maintaining that moving forward, which is what I think is going to continue to drive the business forward. It's always asking that question, what else is out there? What else does that mean? Complete, complete engagement with your team, complete respect for every single person that works for you. When you really, in your heart, respect everybody that works for you and you know how much you need, and I use that word very carefully, how much you need them, you're going to get all of them. Because they, when you look at them with those eyes, they know how important they are. So they're very much an essential part of our drive moving forward. So it's just constantly asking those questions. What else is out there? What do we need to do inside the tea bag? We have innovation in the bag. We have innovation outside the bag. We were talking earlier about some of the things that I do. We just launched a craft beer with a craft family, uh, a company that makes craft beers. Now, is it going to be huge? Is it going to whatever? No, but it's an interesting way to plant additional seeds of other things we're doing. So it's just challenging ourselves to make sure we never lose sight of our quality. We never compromise, which is very hard to do in this seat. There's, it's so easy to compromise. It is so easy to cut corners. And I can never let that happen. And I need to train that next generation of all the leaders around me to make sure we stay true to that. And then we're always looking at every opportunity. Amazing. I heard so much in that. Um, and one of the things that really came through was just the real focus on people. Um, I would love to know, um, what are some of the things that you do to let people know, like, hey, like, regardless of whether there are technological uh, changes, I know you recently invested $2 million in a new manufacturing facility to improve automation and technology. How do you make people feel kind of secure um, and feel valued kind of even in the midst of uh, these changes? Well, first of all, you have to be someone that, people can trust, which means you have to be consistent. Your message can't change. You can't just all of a sudden see something over here that looks good and it's more profitable and now you're changing sort of what you've said you're going to be doing because you're never going to get the trust of, the, of your teammates and that's all 450 teammates. That's not just the executive team that's around me. So they need to trust you which means at no point can you say something that is not true. And I remember when I, um, the, the, 
president prior to me was a wonderful human being. And he would get up and speak. We'd do our State of the Unions and talk to the employees. And I would sit in the audience. Uh, I was vice president of nothing at the time. Actually, I was just called vice president. <laughs> <laughs> vice president of what? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nothing and everything. <laughs> and I remember one time he got up in front of the employees and he spoke. And I knew what he was saying. It wasn't really, I'll just say spot on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little off the truth. And then I got up and spoke after him. And I had to figure out how to honor him and that he's coming from the right spot with his heart, but that's not the truth. And the employees need to hear the truth. And I, I don't say say the truth in a way that it scares the bejesus out of people. I'm just saying they got to know the truth. And so I had to figure out how to say what he said and then bring it back into the realm of what really was. Mm -hmm. And I watched the employees sort of watch that transformation and it's those things that they really realize that at no time are you ever going to compromise that. So you really need to build the trust so that when you say something to the employees, they know you mean it. So automation is what you're talking about. Actually, we've invested a lot more than $2 million. We're at, uh, almost $100 million over the next five years. We have no idea where we're getting $100 million from, but that's another story, <laughs> especially at this interest rate. Anyway, so uh, an automation is a big part of what we're doing because we produce all our bags in the United States of America. That is expensive. And our model, for anyone who drinks Big Low Tea, which I'm not going to ask, but I, I hope if I asked, every hand would go up. So I'm in my own mind going to see every hand up right now. So, but our model is the best tea, the best quality in the world for a price that everyone can afford. That's our model. So it makes it very, very difficult to maintain that model when you have costs going up, because I can't compromise. If if a rose hip goes up $2 from the country we want to buy our rose hip from, I can't move to another country. I cannot do that. It changes the quality, changes the mouthfeel, it changes the color. The recipe is ruined, and our customers will know that. So it's really, really important that I also automate. But I tell my team I'm automating with the expectation that I can keep 450 and still grow the business another 20 and 30 and 40% over the years. That is automation. That's what I have to do. So we recently, and what you were saying is we invested $2 million in three pieces of equipment that are automating the case packing that's coming in, which did take, did require humans. And so, but those humans were fine. They were never going anywhere. We, we need them, trust me, in so many places. So uh, they had not quite come in yet. And I was on the manufacturing floor, and this particular individual I love, and I said, good morning, Roberto, how are you? And he didn't really smile at me. And I was like, that's not Umberto, I know. So I went to the plant manager, I said, something's wrong. He goes, what, I said, something's wrong with Umberto. I don't know what it is, but something's wrong. I don't know, but that's not him. Maybe it's a house, a home problem, right? That's fine. It could be a home issue, could be had a couple with somebody that we work with, but you gotta find out. And it turned out that he didn't quite understand all of the aspects of the fact that his job was safe and that we were bringing in these machines. He felt that his job that he'd been doing for 12 years was over. And the gym, Took the time, made sure it was communicated in a way that he could completely understand it. The next time I saw Alberto, he was like, hello, Cindy. <laughs> I was like, yay, it's a good day. Uh, but anyway, but that's what you have to do. You have to really mean business. And so that's why they trust me. They know I care. They know no one's going anywhere. Absolutely need you. I would just like not to have to hire at the same rate that I'm hiring, but also grow the business. So it really boils down to communication uh, and trust. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, one of the things that uh, we got to chat about yesterday in our pre-event call um, was how in line manufacturing and management are at Bigelow. Um, would love to hear just yeah. a little bit more about that um, and any great anecdotes you have um, from the manufacturing floor. Well, one of the things I will say is it is a blessing that uh, corporate and manufacturing are one building and one uh, family. That's you know, very rare, by the way. That's extremely rare. And, you know, we just, it's just one building, right? It's just unusual. That's not normally the case. And what I try to say to my uh, team uh, in the corporate business is you are so blessed to have manufacturing individuals literally two seconds away to go visit and get on the floor and say hi and see the people 
that are making these tea bags, right? If we don't have people to make the tea bags, we don't have a business, right? And so sometimes maybe marketing and sales can get wrapped up in their marketing and sales, but you're missing an amazing opportunity. To me, it's what really gives you a much better expansive view of life, and it's more than just making a tea bag. So I'm always really proud of the fact that we have that, I call that a, a luxury. Yeah. Uh, there are times when people say, do you want to, because we're running out of space, do you want to split and have manufacturing uh, stay in this building and then you start a, another corporate headquarters? And I'm like, no, not on my watch. We are all, you know, one family. And it just, I don't know, it, for me, it, it just keeps me, I guess, very grounded. Uh, there's, no, I don't cry, which I'm very capable of doing, but there's, <laughs> No question when I go on the manufacturing floor and I have individuals that have been there forever and they say this is and this is them speaking, this is my company. This is my company. And that's what they really believe. And they do that because it's it is one family and they're treated like one family. So it's a gift. It's a I think it's a rare gift and it's a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the reason this really resonates with me is my family business also has integrated manufacturing and management. And so in our offices, you can like see out under the floor. Um, we'll take turns like going out, like make, doing the production, getting They're the, the ones that make a business a business. Exactly. <laughs> How would you sell 2.2 billion bags if you didn't have people making those tea bags every day? And, and I always say to my leadership, team, do you want to get on that floor and make those tea bags? No. I said, well, then you better thank those people every single day that they're making it. Because they're working hard every single day to make those bags. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. So I think at this time, I would love, Cindy, thank you so much. This has been amazing to get to hear all of your insights, all of your experience. I think we would actually open it up to questions, if that's okay with you. Any questions are also welcome, too. I love them. You don't want me to pick, do you? Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> get some mics. All right. Let me know when mics arrive. All right, perfect. Go ahead. Cool. Um, Cindy, thank you for being here. It's so impressive to see. Oh, and uh, if you could give your name and where oh, you're from, that'd be sure, great. Sure, of course. Uh, my name is Terrence Alexander. I'm from Dallas uh, in Texas. And a question I had for you was, on your path towards becoming a CEO, I guess I'm curious, what were the biggest kind of like pieces of feedback that you received from your team that you had to action upon and kind of change about yourself um, once you came to a place of formal leadership? I got a lot of feedback. Um, one of the things I will suggest, again, for wherever you decide to give your all, is that you, I had to also fight my own battles along the way. So when I had any issues, and I did, I never went to my family on that. And that bothered my father because he was like, why don't you tell us anything that's going on? And I was like, because I can't. It's for me to deal with. So I had a lot of lessons along the way. Um, you know, I had some individuals that working for had styles that I didn't think was appropriate, and those were very important for me. I always say that you learn just as much, if not more, by watching behavior that is, in your opinion, destructive and um, just really not effective at all. So I learned a lot along the way there. And I just had to learn to just have my own battles behind closed doors. When people had something to say to me, if I agreed or I disagreed, uh, I tried to listen to everyone, even if I would not necessarily agree with what they were saying. I tried to say there's a nugget. My team will also always hear me say there's a nugget in there that I, I can do better with. So I guess just I always challenge myself every step of the way to how I could be better, uh, and I need to be better, and I honestly knew that about myself. So there were a lot of lessons along the way, that's for sure. Hey, Cindy, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Mo, I'm from Germany. Uh, I actually had a- And school program, if you could. Sorry? A uh, school program, school. Oh, I'm in the ABA program. Uh, I actually had a tea company myself not too long ago, uh, Bottle Tea. Um, it's not there anymore because of supply chain issues, but- oh, um, oh. Oh. <laughs> was I not just talking about supply chain earlier to somebody? I was like, oh. oh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, there's a lot of consolidation happening, especially in consumer and retail, and it's a very low margin space. How do you think about longevity of the business, and do you also think about maybe um, selling the company down the line in terms of M&A? Well, there's a lot of consolidation in the world of tea, and it makes me sad, but I can't live in the past. Uh, the tea business uh, and all of those businesses associated with it were very, very close. Uh, very, very good people. Um, 
I just I have to say it's it's sad for me because they're all selling out and they're they're consolidating and you know our suppliers which have been you know our partners for 30 years are you know selling to much larger companies now because the category is a good category and everything changes uh, your contacts you have to fight for the quality the pricing goes up substantially which is really an issue so but for me um, I can only say that I didn't watch my father work as hard as he did and as much as I am dedicated to ever want to sell the business. Uh, so I have already set up the leadership for the next 15 to 20 years because, again, I talked about trust. Those individuals that work with me have to trust that I'm not just selling it for money. And I started off by saying, and it's a strange thing, but it means so much more to me now, that my father was never an individual that you talked about money. It was about, there was just nothing about anything like that in the family. So people will say, hey, you could blah, 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 make X amount of money. I, I go, I don't, I, I don't understand it. But that's me. That's how I was raised. I don't expect everybody to be like that. So selling it would mean absolutely nothing to me. I would never, ever want to do that. It's more important for me to have 450 people that I can make a positive environment for, which is going to be 500 and 550. I'm just trying to slow down that growth a little bit. But <laughs> um, to create a positive environment and create a positive product, that to me is what's important. So I have no such plans. And as I said, I've really put together a leadership program for the next 15 to 20 years, even what that means from a stock transfer perspective. My job is to protect that company. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to try to extend it that one day if I'm not here in another 40 years, which that might be a little long, but uh, I'm going to try. Uh, I'm going to try to also do things, even when one day I've passed, that I can try to protect it. I know at one point I can't continue to do that, but that's my goal. So say, thank you for asking. Hi, <clears throat> Cindy. Thank you so much for coming down. I am a first year MBA student. Uh, the question I have is on, on leadership. Uh, just, I guess looking back at your career and even now, what was the toughest decision you've had to make? And in retrospect, do you think the decision was good? And uh, second question, in, just given that you're a CEO of a family business, have you had to manage you know, conflict between family members and how, how best are you, are you, yeah. are you, did you handle it? Well, on, okay, so there's two questions. One is uh, on the family issues and conflict. That's a definite one, and that would be down a, a long journey. And <laughs> for sure. Uh, talk about it later. And your first question was, which, what was your first question? Toughest decision. Oh, yeah. Mm, uh, there's so many tough decisions I make every single day. Some keep me up at night. Some not as much. One of the things that I would say in general in this position, and I recommend it for everybody, is you have to be fluid. You cannot try to control everything. Uh, you know, there might be some people in the room that say, yeah, I'm not trying to control everything. I think you need to ask yourself, are you really trying to control everything? Because if you are, you're ne in my opinion, you're never going to really be able to ascend because you're going to get buried. You're going to get crushed. And so some decisions are very hard. I try to do it with good counsel around me, uh, and I understand that they won't always be the right decision, but I think that if you care enough and you challenge yourself and you have the right counsel around you, most of all your difficult decisions will be the right decision long term. So I, I can't say that I can look back on a decision and say, oh God, I'm really sorry I did that one, because then I have to say, boy, you need to think hard about how you got to that place. I can say that I've had to work hard <laughs> Um, in making difficult decisions, how I handle that. That would be the biggest thing that I've had to learn from where, especially in 05, when I first became the CEO, I might have been handling the pressures and the decisions in a way that that is where I really needed to do the most growing. Now, in terms of my family conflict, uh, that was rich. <laughs> <laughs> All the family business folks just laughed. So. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think in every business, conflict is significant. I think learning early on how to deal with conflict in a way that you're able to communicate it head on, but thoughtfully, but head on. And sometimes that looks like a, a competing, you know, uh, interest. I don't think that is. Like, I needed to learn very early on 
with my father that I needed to look through his eyes first. And we talked about this yesterday, Wangane and I. You have to, I had to look through his eyes first before I started anything that we were in a disagreement with. And if I started looking through his eyes first, it already softened the argument because he was being, he felt valid, validated. That was a really important thing. So I don't care if it's a family member or I don't care if it's your boss. Every, and your partner, or someone that you're working with, they need to feel validated. So the, the lesson for me about dealing with conflict, which I had many and they were painful and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get to where I am today, it was at one point I was like, I don't think so. I don't know if it's worth it. But um, I did, thank heavens. I'm here. So, but it really, what the tool that I used was always looking through the other person's eyes first. That was very, very helpful. It was a success. And again, we talked about that yesterday. Absolutely. Hi, Cindy. <clears throat> oh, we go here. Hi. Well, then we'll get back to you too, whichever. <laughs> yeah. Th uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm Ryan. I'm a second year MBA, originally from New Jersey, but actually used to live in Fairfield, Connecticut. So oh. Familiar with your building. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my question is how did you? Choose Fairfield for your, your headquarters, and what role has the Fairfield community played in the yeah. history of your company? Um, well, uh, I love Fairfield, but that, I, I didn't choose Fairfield. I guess Fairfield, I guess, chose me in the sense that um, when I started the business after Kellogg, it was in Norwalk, and that's where my grandmother started the business. I didn't know any better, right? So that's where I went. And then we had a warehouse in Fairfield that they expanded again before my anything exposure to leadership, and they built the building. So then, um, and I will tell you, it's because my father didn't want a long commute. So that's how Fairfield got picked. Uh, and we are so out, like, sizing this current building we're in right now, but I so love the community. So we just bought 25 acres up the street, up the road, and a couple towns up. And uh, the mayor's all excited that we're moving there. I'm like, nee, slow it down, pal. Uh, <laughs> I just love Fairfield. So I'm going to you know, fight everything I have to stay there as long as I can do because it's just a community that I think have been very good to us, and we love them. So, yeah, I'm very blessed to be in Fairfield, but I just was fortunate. I didn't pick it. Picked me. Hi. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for being here. I'm... Sophie, first year MBA student too from Spain. Um, my question was, you were talking about uh, the leadership program that you set up for the next 15, 20 years. Yes. And my family has a family business too, and they're worried about this. So I was wondering, it being a family business and supposing you want to hand over the control to someone in the family, how do you go up about setting up the program, choosing who you're eventually going to hand over to, maybe especially if there's no one in the family who apparently wants to take it over like on a... I believe that whether it's a family member or a non-family member, it is something that needs to be a conversation and a focus for a very long time. There should be no secrets. So if it's a family member who you feel has the particular skill sets that you are making it clear that they need to be doing X, Y, and Z, they need to be showing their own value, they need to be developing their own ability for people to want to follow them, and by the time you're passing a baton, it is clear that that person was chosen for all the right reasons. The same thing applies if it's a non-family member. This should not be a surprise. This should be something that has been groomed, worked on, communicated, developed, uh, because it's so critical. It's not just you passing the baton. It's the entire organization following. So it has to be not behind closed doors or hidden. Now, the conversations about, like, who and what and where earlier on, that might be behind closed doors in the conversations you have with those around you that you trust. But then after there's a decision made, you really need to get out there and let people know that they need to, the next leader needs to show that they're the next leader for all the right reasons. Not because I say you're the next leader, because you have earned that. And the next individual knows that at this company. And part of that is being on the manufacturing floor. They need to let them know that they care about them as much as the family cares about them, right? And you do that by listening and really, really listening and uh, just, just that full engagement. So, yep, that's very important. That's a great question. Great question. A lot of people don't want to deal with it. Actually, I told my father I was coming here today and his business is similar. It's also in the food industry. And he was like, I want you to ask this. Tell him all I'm taking the credit. I've got a lot to say about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diana. I'm Hi. a second year um, EMBA student. Thank you for being here. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, 
Um, we we see how well I do with two questions. So I'm going to ask that, you know, like, repeat the first one, but I'm going to work really hard to remember both of them. I'll remind you. Um, the first question is, what do you feel most confident about in terms of all the efforts that are put in place to grow the business? So, like, what do you feel most confident about in terms of driving your growth strategy? And then the second question is, what's your favorite tea flavor? <laughs> oh, my God, that was such a great second question. <laughs> I don't know if I use the word confident. That wouldn't be part of a conversation that I would hold. I would say that I work very hard to ensure that all the strategies that we're working on have amazing foundation, amazing support, and are all done for the right reasons. Right? So I think we've done a lot of things right, which is why I say we confuse all the competition. They don't quite understand why we're so successful, and I say it's, multi it's multiple reasons, right? It's it's having a rich relationship with your supply chain. And I mean an intimate relationship with your supply chain and making sure that you understand if we're having an issue with a country that's giving you the quality product that you need, that's going to be scarce, what are you doing now, five years earlier, to, in order to prepare for that? So it's your supply chain, it's your people development, it's your vision on where you want to go with product and packaging uh, and channels. So it's it's really identifying what's important, where you want to go, and making sure you got everything there for the best you can for success is the word I would say. And T. <laughs> you thought I forgot that question? <laughs> <laughs> I know. You did. Um, I can't say I have one. I tell this to people I have like 150 children. You pick one. So I, I love a lot. It costs a comment. Long and I love that. Earl Grey, our new green with elderberry, our a ginger peach with turmeric. Um, I, you know, I really do. I love them all, and I try to move it around, right? Because I don't want any of them to feel left out of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amazing! Thank you so much for coming through um, today and speaking to us. I'm Jack. I'm a first year MBA student. I'm half Italian, half German. Um, my, my question is actually, before you joined your family business, yeah. did you always see like the potential your family business had? And when did you decide that it was a good time to join? Mm, that's a great question. Um, you know, for me, very funny, um, I, I always sometimes feel a little bit bad answering the question because I also do have a wonderful opportunity to talk to young people a lot. And I always say, your passion it doesn't just happen when you're like 16 or 18 or 20 or 25, and maybe it does for a few in the room, but sometimes it just takes time. You know, I can tell the people that work for me that are so passionate, that grew with being in a business that they believed in that they had an impact on. And now, you know, I always say, hey, we make tea bags. How passionate can you be? Really, really passionate. But they didn't start that way, right? So passion takes time. Uh, and what you want to do takes time. And you're supposed to be a little curvy. Um, for me, it was unusual. I, in high school, said, yeah, I want to run that business. And I don't consider myself the most ambitious human, but I just said, oh, no, I want to do that. And that's just all I wanted to do. And people asked me the other day, did you want to work in it or run it? I said, oh, no, I wanted to run it. I didn't know any better. I literally did not know any better. That's just what I wanted to do. Did I say, oh, my God, what is the potential on this business? No way. I wasn't even smart enough to think that way. But I just knew that this was phenomenal because I'd known the people because I'd worked there when I was 16 and packed tea bags and got all the cuts on my fingers and blah, blah, blah. You know, at 17, I was selling displays into stores and tripping when I walked in. I was so embarrassed and, you know, whatever. But I just, that's what I always wanted to do. And I, I just, I am very fortunate. I just... I love it. I love the people. I pinch myself. Got all kinds of issues around my life that, you know, I have to work on and all kinds of issues in the office, but I never lose sight of the appreciation of what a gift I have. I have an amazing gift. And everyone I know works with works me knows that I look at them and, and they're part of my gift and I thank them all the time. Appreciating whatever you do, I think, is a big part of success. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, you didn't ask me two questions, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here, Cindy. I'm Kushagra, a second year MBA from India. I, uh, my family also actually has a tea plantation business in India. Oh. So we're also really interested. Where in, in India? Uh, in Assam. Oh! Yeah, so. I was just there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw some Assam tea yeah. in one of the yeah. packets. You see the Assam tea in our products, trust me. Yeah, we love Assam tea. <laughs>
So I, I just I like how you say it more than I say. I got to correct myself. You say a Sam. I say a Sam. Yeah. A Sam. I, yeah. A Sam. Okay, I'm going to fix that. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's important. It's the tea I sell. <laughs> So um, I wanted to ask about what consumer trends are you seeing in the U.S. and how they've changed over time and where do you see them going? You know, that's a great question, especially for an individual that really is steeped. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's very little things I can say that somehow doesn't work itself back around, you know, but it's true. Um, but it's steeped in the business. And uh, basically the tea business is broken into three categories. It is the black tea, it's the green tea, and it's the herbal tea. The, the most significant growth in the United States has been uh, the herbal tea business. So we are blessed that uh, you know black tea was where our, our origins were, and we were really very good at blending them, getting the best teas in the world, often from Assam, and, and, and really making sure that we're continuing to focus on the development of our black teas and our green teas. But herbal is really where so many people are going to, because they love the idea of having turmeric and ginger. We try to put them in the green and the black as well. But I can tell you, I can put ginger in an herbal tea, and it goes soup. <laughs> and I put a ginger in a black tea, and it goes up, but not the same. So I would say the trends are really moving toward uh, the herbal products. Plus, it's just very healthy. Tea is just a great beverage for you, right? And it's not that expensive. So I think it's got a long runway. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, one last question. No pressure. Hope it's good. Uh, the Go flip ahead. side of that question, I recently was watching TV and saw a Bigelow ad, and I was wondering, and I hadn't seen that prior, and I was wondering what else you're doing to match uh, demands in terms of production, but also other levers that you can pull to continue to move Bigelow through. And forward, right. Yeah. That's I a great question. Ad and it was great. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you. Since I was featured in it, you better like it. Right? <laughs> so no, but the, our big issue is, believe it or not, and I don't know for any of you before I walked in the room, but nobody knows Bigelow Cheese family. Nobody. People that have drank our product for 30 years have no idea it's family. We have family on the front. We got pictures of the family on the top. We like smack it all over the place. It's family, but nobody knows it. So our whole... Uh, campaign has been to let them know it's a family business and that's been our real focus because I can't say oh maybe it doesn't matter maybe it does matter if you ask somebody do you care if it's a family business most people will say hmm, I don't know but when you start to really introduce the family and you make a connection with the family now a family business matters so that's why you're starting to see that commercials that really are focusing on, it's a little pressure oriented for me, it's not my favorite, but um, <laughs> with, with the family, that's, that's very much part of it, because that is something we're very proud of. It, it is the different, it is part of that, those, uh, you know, those magic steps that we take to be where we are today is the fact that that family care is there. So we're really trying to focus on that in all of our marketing campaigns. Thanks for asking. Fantastic. Um, okay, so Cindy, I actually have one last popcorn question for you, and then we can go ahead and wrap it up. But uh, in maybe one sentence or one phrase, how would your... Oh, I know. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Um, how would your team describe you as a leader? Oh, maybe we should just do one word. <laughs> <laughs> feisty. Uh, no, yeah, I mean feisty. I'm feisty. I'm pretty feisty. <laughs> pretty feisty. I have a lot of energy, and I don't compromise on anything. And there's just nothing that I don't think we can always do better at. That includes myself. And, and you have to have a team that really loves that, and they have to believe in that, and they have to understand that you're doing that all for the right reasons, never for yourself, always for the greater good. So feisty. Feisty is a great word. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so last real question. For okay. You. That um, wasn't a real question? I mean, <laughs> would love to know. We have a room full of MBAs, folks who've gone through the MBA journey, folks who are thinking about their lives and thinking about their careers. What advice do you have for folks in their 20s and 30s? Hmm. Couple, am I allowed to say more than one word? Um, <laughs> this time, yes. <laughs> um, a couple things. Um, one is spend the quality time really challenging yourself on what's important to you. Really take the time. What's important to you? Try to identify those couple things and try to stay true to them if you can through your journey. The second issue is to never forget you are all role models every day of your life. It doesn't matter how young you are. You are role modeling. 
when you walk in the door, when you hold the door open, when you greet somebody, when you say hello to the individual that you just bought a cup of tea from, you are role models. Please don't forget that. You are teaching the world how to act. You are showing them what's acceptable behavior. And I take that very, very seriously. You do not know the people you're going to impact in your life. You have no idea. But I guarantee you there's somebody. And maybe many people. So don't ever forget you're a role model. Um, learn to deal with conflict. Learn to address conflict in a thoughtful but yet forthright way. Thoughtful and forthright. Conflict is part of life. And the more you learn to deal with it, the better you will be at feeling good about who you are and maybe good about who you are working with. The next thing is engage and lift. Please, I ask you, to whatever you do, I don't care what you do. You don't care what I really do. <laughs> Maybe a little bit now. <laughs> I made you by sort of yelling at you for the last half an hour. But <laughs> engage and lift the room. Lift the room. Lift the person. Lift the project. Lift the plan. It's easier said than done. It isn't about you. It is about the mission, whatever it is. So engage and lift. People want to work with people that are making them better, that want them to be better. And you have a gift. Use it. Engage and lift. Um, and lastly, I guess I would say try to live one life. I work with people that they say they're one way at home and they're another way in the business, and that's okay. Well, it may be okay for you. It may be okay for them. It's not okay for me. I'm one person, and I want to be one person when I'm in the office, when I'm with my kids, when I'm driving, when I'm walking with friends. I want to try to be one person, which is feisty, which is honest, which doesn't mean you're going to love me every second. No way. But I don't want to be two different people. And in business, I see sometimes it's okay to be two people. I, I'm here to say that you don't have to be two people. You don't have to. So that'd be my advice. Thank you so much for me.